Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kayla Collingwood, and I'm a Master of Music student uh, studying classical performance voice. I'm a mezzo-soprano classical singer. My research focuses on translations and how they're utilized in the repertoire of the classical vocal world. This topic came about as I, earlier in the year, performed a role in New Zealand Opera's production of Mozart's The Magic Flute, and it was performed in English. It's very common for foreign language operas to be translated into various languages uh, in order to make the work more accessible. Songs are also commonly translated and have been throughout history. This is most commonly done by either translating pre-existing literary works or translating something in a way that fits with music when it's a language which has already been um, set to music. And also sometimes the text are tr uh, transmitted to the audience through the use of surtitles in opera or translations in the programme. Tonight I would like to share with you Ravel's Chant Populaire, a set of songs by French composer Maurice Ravel. They were the respective winners in the 1910 Maison du Lied uh, composition competition in Moscow. The four songs are settings of existing folk songs and are in four different dialects, Galician, Limousin, Neapolitan, and Yiddish. As part of the competition, the songs are also published with Russian and French translations, and I have looked at the French specifically. Uh, the Spanish translation into French is interesting, as it is very different. And the Hebrew song combines both Yiddish and Hebrew, and has completely different origins to the other dialects. I will be performing them in my recital in December as well, so if you want to hear them again, you can come along. Um, and they're also a case study in my thesis. They will be performed in the original languages. And unfortunately, as we were unable to get a piano in here, I've had to do a, a recorded performance this morning, very last minute, so bear with me with the quality. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just go and play them through there. Thank you. <laughs>
I was just wondering, how do you find these pieces if sung in, say, the French translations versus the, the, the well, the Russian, for example, which we obviously haven't heard, but, you know, how do, how do they function differently? Uh, well, particularly for the Hebrew-Yiddish one, if you try, I did, oh yeah. um, I had a go at singing them through in French, and it's very different, particularly for that one, it's just a completely different language structure and there's so much history behind the language as well you can't compare the two really and translation itself is such an art as you can never get a perfect translation so you're always going to lose some of the essence that you get in the original language um, the spanish one there is um, the spanish um, and the french Although they're fairly similar in origin, they're both Latin-based languages, uh, I don't know what the French decided to do, but the story is completely different. <laughs> um, at the very end of that one, um, there's a line about they go like roses and they return like Negroes, to do with the uh, colour of the skin, obviously. And somehow the French ended up talking about that they go like roses and they come back like thorns. So <laughs> there's things like that which just, you lose the entire sense of what the Spanish was trying to say. Oh, thank you very much. Um, it was um, it would, would have been great to see the performance yeah. live. That's um, um, and when you talk about lost in translation, um, you also lose a little bit. I think when you see it on the screen rather than in um, real life. But um, I mean, given the t limitations of our venue, it's a bit of a shame. Um, your research does t touch upon a very important point, and that anybody who's dealing with um, the need to translate material, uh, especially if you're in the humanities, dealing with our uh, ancient languages is always that problem of um, trying to get the uh, the feeling of the la uh, original meaning across into the whatever language you're translating it in um, but in your case uh, this is going to sound very simple so excuse me my uh, esteemed colleagues uh, um, what, what couldn't you still maintain um, the original language but uh, provide the audience with uh, the translated copy I mean that way you'd still be able to keep the original, uh, yet still potentially get the meaning across in, in a way. Uh, yes, you can do that, and they often do. Often you'll have the translations in the printed program or above the stage. Um, the feedback that we often get about that is that it's distracting. <laughs> and when it comes to being the program, a lot of people don't actually read the programs. So that is um, a problem as well. Yes. If you're an academic and you arrive in plenty of time for the concert, you can, we can give you the program and go for your life, read it. <laughs> yeah. Do you, um, I can probably talk loud enough. Do you find, just from the magic book, which I saw, well done. Oh, thank you. Um, did you find that the magic flute was more complicated to watch in English because you understood everything that was going on than... Because obviously most of us could not understand the Yiddish. 
Mm. Um, yes and no. There's, when you're translating, you can choose whether to use a more harsh word or a gentler word uh, related to the context of the audience you're trying to reach. That particular translation that we used was by a Scottish translator. Um, he wrote it for a specific kind of audience. A lot of people did find that it was difficult to hear those concepts of racism and sexism. So thrust in your face, whereas you can hide away from it a bit more when it's another in another language. It was always written into the story of the magic flute, but you can't hide from it when it's in your own language. <laughs> so it, it itself, in itself is a translation of the message 